the woman's off and that scene is dissipated and there's some Pharisees still there. He's still in, he's in the treasury, uh, which is amazing because that's the place where you merchandise God's people. <laughs> um, verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them and said, now that's the Jews. She, he told her to go away, you know, don't say any more, go ahead. You know, the idea is that she's gone and now he's left talking to all these Jews in the treasury. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And remember, in him is life, and the life is the light of man. Um, this is the word made flesh, who is the light of the world. Uh, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. Now, that's just twisting what he said and throwing it back in his face. In John, about a chapter and a half ago, he said, you know, uh, I don't need the witness of man. I've got the Father and his works that bear witness of me, right? Um, and so they're taking those words and throwing them back in their face, back in his face. It shows what spirit they're of. And Jesus answered and said, though I bear record of myself, my record is true, for I know where I come from and where I go. But you cannot tell where I come from and where I go. Now that's the same thing as he said to Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, we know you're from God because of the miracles you do. Jesus said, you have to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it wills and you can tell the sound of it and you can see the leaves rustling. But you don't understand where the wind is coming from. And for that reason, you can't discern between when it's just supernatural something or when it's actually from God. And for that reason, you can't discern who I am. Um, and he says, you judge after the flesh, but I judge no man. Which is interesting because he's been given authority to execute judgment, right? And he's talking about this scene. They, the woman with the adulterous woman, they judge according to the flesh. But he didn't judge her because he didn't come into the world to condemn it. But the world through him might be saved, right? Um and yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. If I bear witness, I am one that bears witness of myself, and my Father that sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? And Jesus said, You neither know me or my Father. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. We keep seeing that in John. His hour speaks of the time when he gave himself to be delivered over. Men didn't take him. He delivered himself. He arranged the event. He is the conductor. He's in charge of the timing of the crisis and to bring everything to a head, you know. Um, and then Jesus said to them, I go my way and you shall seek me and you shall die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said, you are from beneath and I am from above. You're of this world. I am not of this world. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am, he is in italics, I am, you shall die in your sins. Now, this is a claim to deity that he's going to develop. He is claiming to be the voice that spoke to Moses from the burning bush and the one that appeared to Abraham, as we'll see. Um, but he says, look, you're of this world and I'm not. And if you don't believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. To die in your sins is something we don't want. If you die in your sins, then when you're raised, you don't get to be part of the first resurrection. You're raised to the second resurrection, which is the great white throne judgment, where every word, every idle word you've spoken and every thought you thunk, thunk, sorry, is going to be played out in front of you. And then you're going to be cast into the lake of fire because you're going to be shown to be an adulterer, a blasphemer, a murderer in your heart, all these things that God sees. So it's very important to not die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, that means you're raised as a sinner. So you stand there with all that enmity towards God. 
and the blasphemy in your heart. And then God is fully manifested at the great white throne and you're fully manifested. And the two can't uh, coexist. <laughs> so uh, to not be in your sin is to be in Christ. We need to be in Christ. We need to have his righteousness imputed to us so that we don't die in our sins. And we do that by believing that he is. We believe in him. We believe that he's the Lamb of God. We believe that he died for our sins. We believe he rose from the dead. And we believe that he is from God and went back to God. And he is the way to the Father. Um, then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said, even the same as I told you from the beginning. In other words, I've been saying this. I have many things to judge, say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I've heard of him. They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. Okay, first he's saying I am. Now he's saying he's the Son of Man. It's his divinity and his humanity and his being lifted up. That's, that is the gospel. What is this being lifted up? Well, we talked about it in the last message. When Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so that everybody would behold him and be healed from the snake bites, that was a picture of Christ's manner of death and resurrection. That when he was lifted up, he became the propitiation and the declaration of God's righteousness. God's vindication in his decision to justify the ones who believe in Jesus. That's us. Um, but he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you shall know that I am he. Or I am, I'm sorry, you shall know that I am. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. He that sent me is with me, and the Father is not with me alone, for I do those things which please him. I always do those things which please him. Who can say that? Only Christ, and that is the burnt offering. Always pleasing the Father in the entirety of his being, at all times, in every moment, from eternity to eternity, without ceasing, without interruption, in incorruptibility, by the eternal life, forever. Anything short of that is short of God's glory. When the Bible says that we fell short of the glory, that's what it's talking about. We don't even come close. On our best day, we're not even close. And he spoke these words, and many believed in him. So that's good, right? Then said Jesus to the Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus came to liberate us. Uh, and Galatians, for example, is the book that tells us to stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And that yoke is the law, really. It's the world system. It's Satan. It's sin lording it over you. It's condemnation. It's no freedom to abide in Christ and enjoy him because you think he's mad. That's really what bondage looks like. Freedom means I agree most of the time, if not all the time, with the witness of the spirit that I am a child of God. I've been given the spirit of sonship in which I cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself witnesses with my spirit that I am a child of God and of a child and an heir. And I know that my inheritance is secure I know that my destiny is secure. I know my father loves me. I know even when I make mistakes, all I have to do is ask for wisdom and he gives to me liberally without upbraiding. He's not angry at me. When he disciplines me, it's for my own good to bring me into rest and into enjoyment of Christ as my Sabbath. Um, and the more I know about Jesus Christ by his continuing in his word, I learn of him, and he makes me free. Period. There is no path to freedom apart from the word. Uh, and remember, again, this is John who's writing after Paul died 30 years later. And there's Pauline truth shining through all this. What's, all, what's Pauline truth? Pauline truth is the truth that was revealed by the ascended Christ after he resurrected and uh, after he ascended, after he sat down at the right hand of God, after he purged our sins, after he sent the Holy Spirit, after he became the high priest, 
after he regenerated us and made us members of his body, he, after he started the church, he revealed a body of truth that is still his word. You know, some people say, I'm a red-letter Christian. I just pay attention to the words of Jesus. No, the words of Jesus is the, you have to receive the entire counsel. Not just what he said on earth, but what he spoke from the throne. Uh, the word from heaven, uh, where Paul says in Hebrews, you know, um, every word that was spoken by angels received a just recompense if it was ignored. How much more uh, will we be in peril if we neglect him who spoke from heaven? God spoke from heaven in his son in the ministry of the, of the church, in the, in the New Testament ministry. That is the ministry of the ascended Christ. And John is written from that position. On the one hand, it's about Jesus while he walked on the earth and what he taught, but it's from the perspective that this is written to the church to whom the mysteries were di disclosed, the Pauline mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and Christ as the mystery of God and the revelation of God. That's known. So the teachings in John focus, have a laser focus on keep bringing us back to the realization of what the ascended Christ has revealed about who he is. That's why John is so different. That's why John is built on the realization that in him dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John is built on the revelation that the mystery of Christ is the church, which is his body, the habitation of God, the building of God, and that God dwells in man now, and man dwells in God, and Christ is one with us, and we've received the life-giving spirit, and the river of the water of life has come forth, the spirit of the glorified Christ that we've been talking about, which is in us as a fountain ready to spring up unto eternal life and is in us as an enjoyable wine for us to taste and have a foretaste of the wedding feast and to enjoy Christ as our Feast of Tabernacles. All that kind of truth is really only unlocked once you're born again. So many of the things in John are for born-again believers and come from the ministry of the ascended Christ, which was first really revealed uh, through Paul, you know, but John and Peter built on it. They're all, it's all one ministry, one New Testament ministry. Okay. So when we say, when he says, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed. That's not just red letter Jesus. That's Romans Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, Jesus, Hebrews, Jesus, Peter, Jesus, John, Jesus. All of that is my word. And you won't get free if you only continue in the red letter Jesus words. The ones that he spoke while he was on the earth before the conclusion of his earthly ministry and before the beginning of his heavenly ministry. We are partakers of a heavenly calling. We're citizens of heaven. And we are uh, heirs of truths and facts that have been established after the ascension of Christ and have been revealed to the church from the Christ that is seated on the throne, the glorified Christ. That also is the word of Christ. So don't let anybody tell you that Paul is at odds with Jesus and you don't have to listen to Paul and you don't have to listen to the apostles. Just stay focused on the gospels only. That's not going to get you free. You're still, if you're looking at the Gospels only, you're, t you're reading it from a position of somebody who's still dead in your sins. Before Christ has died <laughs> and made uh, the sacrifice and reconciled you to God and given you the Spirit and made you one with Him and made you a member of His body. That truth is revealed in the words of Christ, which are, spoken after he ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And we need the whole counsel of it to be called the word of Christ. Uh, that's the truth that you make you free. The truths that have made me free are primarily in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians.
that's where I've been for 15 years or so. That's been my primary focus. And I can tell you that I am much freer today. Now, what does that freedom look like? It just means I can finally be myself, knowing that what I am is acceptable to God because of Christ. And to the degree that I learn to rest in his acceptance of me, uh, new creation realities are in my life. Things I used to struggle to get free from by my own effort and re listening to Joyce Meyer teachings and reading books after books after books of spiritual growth and discipline and all the different things and the burdens I piled up on myself. All that stuff comes freely now because I know my position in Christ. That doesn't mean I don't struggle. But the, by focusing on the word of Christ, you get free. There's no other way. You can listen to me talk about it, but you need to be in it, you know? And I really worry about YouTube right now because it looks like even after all the speaking for the last couple years, people can't seem to discern the gospel and don't even recognize um, a corrupted or another gospel message. And it's like, and people are sick of hearing about it. They're like, oh, we're just sick of the arguments. We just want peace. And it's like, that just shows that somehow this truth is not being owned. You know, why? I don't know. Other than maybe people aren't actually continuing in the word. Doesn't mean they're not saved. But to be a disciple, to learn of Christ. See, we're not learning by the earthly Jesus trying to imitate him. Our discipleship is abiding in the heavenly Christ who dwells in us. It's a different kind of learning. And that, again, that truth is revealed in those epistles. You've got to be in the epistles. They're the healthiest food. You don't have to feel guilty if you spent five years in Romans. <laughs> I spent five years in Romans 6 through 8. I couldn't get out of it. And I kept thinking, well, am I supposed to be reading something else, Lord? You know? And I would try, and it just, it was, I would keep going back to Romans 6 through 8, Romans 3, Romans 3, Romans 6 through 8, Romans 3 and 4, 6 through 8. Why? Because that's where the food is. And it's hard to learn that kind of truth, especially when you're swimming in a sea of error. Uh, you know, you really have to have a focus. We're talking about discipleship here. We're not confusing discipleship with salvation. Salvation is believe and be saved. But becoming free is becoming a disciple. Discipleship is not taking a burden on you. It's putting a burden on Christ. Uh, it is taking up his yoke, but you're the little weakling and he's the ox. He's carrying all the weight. And it's learning to rest as he carries you along. That's what discipleship is. In, now that he is ascended. You know, before, on his earthly ministry, when he spoke of discipleship in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are not focused on this mystery of Christ in you, it sounded arduous. You know, deny yourself, take up your cross, hate your father and mother, hate, you know, hate everything. <laughs> and it sounded, you know, how can I do this? You can't. Discipleship, once he's, that's because he had not gone to the cross and accomplished redemption yet. But now that he has ascended and seated at the right hand of God, he has purged our sin, made peace with God for us, and dwells in our spirit as the life-giving spirit to be the other side of this yoke. And he's a 15,000-pound ox, and we're just a 100, you know, 220-pound man. I can't pick up that yoke. He carried it all. So discipleship in the New Testament sense, it, with this new reality in the spirit, is entirely a matter of letting Christ carry me. And it's learning that he is carrying me and learning that he will always carry me. It's entering into his rest. And there is a labor to enter his rest because it is a rest of faith. And faith can't believe what it doesn't know. And where does that knowledge come from? It comes from his word. If you continue in my word, he said to those who believed in him, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know this truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered, We be Abraham's seed and are never in bondage to any man. How can you say you shall be made free? 
Jesus said, Verily I say to you, who commits sin is a servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I've seen with my father, and you do that which you've seen of your father. Now he's getting to the point where he's telling him that his father is the devil. Now, is he saying that to uh, condemn him? No, he's, say, he's already said that he's saying all these things that they may be saved. But see, and you say, yeah, those Jews, they were really of the devil. Well, the Bible tells us that before we were reconciled to God, we were children of wrath by nature, walking according to the course of this world in whom the spirit of uh, the it, let's see the course of this world ruled by the prince of the powers of the air the spirit of disobedience the spirit that operates in the children of disobedience sorry i slaughtered that ephesians 2 there's a spirit that operates in the children of obe disobedience that is the prince of the power of the heirs and makes us heirs of wrath by nature we were all children of the devil we had to be adopted. We had to be saved out of the house of sin. We had to be freed from Satan's dominion. So he's not trying to make them, uh, like he's not ramping up the insult to tell them something new to distinguish them from everybody else and say, you're of the devil. No, this is the human condition. And it's part of what you have to accept if you're going to be free. You, if you want to be free in Christ, you've got to realize what your flesh is. Your flesh is carnal, in enmity with God, hostile to God, an enemy of God, cannot be subjected to God, cannot please God, and must be crucified. And many people get saved, but when he starts talking to you like that, you get offended. The, this is the word of the cross. You know, the word of the cross is... Not only that he reconciled us to God, but that he terminated us because we are useless to God and that we are at odds with God and we are beyond repair. He didn't bring us into our kingdom, into his kingdom, to use our flesh for his service. He brought us into his kingdom so that he could set us free from the motions of the sin in the flesh, which are by the law. And he says, you know... Um, uh, the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son's abides forever. That sounds like Galatians. Galatians talks about the allegory of Hagar and Sarah, Ishmael and Isaac. And Hagar and Sarah, while they were real, I'm sorry, Hagar and Ishmael, while they were real, are a type of Jerusalem with its earthly ordinances, the covenant of Moses, which engenders children under bondage, under the law, slaves. And the slave cannot abide in the house forever. So that's why Ishmael had to be cast out of Abraham's house. He didn't have a position as an heir. He was the result of Abraham trying to accomplish God's work in his flesh. Sarah, we're too old. We can't have a child. I'm going to go into Hagar, my handmaiden, and produce an heir. But that's an illegitimate heir who has no rights. And as such is a picture of, the whole thing is a picture, according to Galatians, of trying to maintain a position before God by law keeping. Which, according to Romans 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, is the strength of sin. The, the sin is strengthened by law keeping. The more you try to keep the law to become righteous, the more you end up hating God. Because when your flesh rises up to try to serve God and its strength, the law of sin in your members also rises up and takes you captive to do its will so that the things you hate are the things you do and the things that you wish you could do, you cannot do. That's the Romans 7 dilemma. And that is the dilemma of someone that needs to be set free by the Son of God. From the house of bondage, from the slavery. The slavery to the law and the slavery to sin go together. They're inseparable. You've got to be delivered from both. That's what Romans 6 and 7 is about. 
Romans 6 shows us that we were crucified with Christ and we died once for, he died once for all to sin and we died with him. And Romans 7 tells us that we died to the law through the body of Christ, that we may be joined to him to bear fruit to God. He becomes the new husband. And remember, John is talking about Christ as the bridegroom. So it all fits together. I hope you see this. This is just inspirational. I'm just speaking whatever the Holy Spirit gives to me in the moment. Uh, so anyway, he says, Verily I say to you, whoever commits sin is a servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the Son abides forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. This is the law of the risen Christ, his life in me. That's what makes me free. And I, it's as I learn to walk according to the Spirit. Again, how am I going to learn that? I've got to continue in his word. I can't have a superficial acquaintance with his word and be free. No, I'll just be saved, but always balking at the word of the cross and always offended by it and never really transferred over into the freedom that we can enjoy as children of God, which we need to grow in. Um, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Um, they hated him and it's because they couldn't recognize his word and it's because the word wasn't richly indwelling them. These people had a uh, relationship to the word, which was like it was dead letters on paper. We have to have a relationship to the word where we see that the word is Christ himself. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory. We need to behold the glory of Christ in the word and let that word dwell in us richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Uh, and I see so many that are offended right now that for some reason can't seem to understand what we're saying and they think we're just speaking high, high, highfalutin jargon and worldly wisdom when we're just speaking the word and it's because the word doesn't dwell in them and doesn't mean they're not saved but unfortunately it makes them enemies you know the children of the flesh persecute the children of the promise according to Galatians and you can be a saved child of the flesh. Just be justified by faith, but then try to perfect yourself in the flesh by law keeping. And you become essentially an Ishmael and you will persecute Isaac. Now that doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but as long as you're walking in that, you're going to bite and devour everybody. You know, uh, anyway, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Now, what is the work of Abraham? To believe. He is the father of the faithful. He's the father of those who believe, whether circumcised or uncircumcised. What did he believe? God's promise. And more than that, he reckoned his own body as though dead, yet counted on him uh, and gave glory to him and waxed strong in faith, giving glory to him who is able to Give life to the dead and call those things that are not as though they are. Eventually, he had to, he had to overcome Ishmael, and, and God visited him again and said, that's not going to be your seed. In, Isaac, in, in, in Sarah, your seed's coming out. They named him Isaac. And Abraham at that point had to say, okay, this will have to be a miracle of life. Look at my body. Look at her, the deadness of Sarah's womb. I know that. But God is able to give life to the dead and call those things that are not as though they are. And that's what we live. That's called positional truth. We learn to live by reckoning on a body of truth that has been revealed to us concerning who Christ is. He is the seed. And he is the life. And when we say, I am crucified with Christ, I'm dead, I can do nothing, Jesus. You have to do it or nothing's going to happen at all. And then we just wait on him. But we grow in faith, learning to reckon more and more on the fact that God is able to give life to the dead. I'm not going to walk by faith. I'm not going to look at my failures. I'm not going to look at my past. I'm not going to look at my weaknesses. I'm looking to God's, what he has spoken concerning what he accomplished in Christ. That's the word of Christ. And the more I set my gaze on that, the more I get free. And I find that Christ 
is starting to be expressed in my life. Not because of the result of conscious effort, but because I'm just believing on him. That's what it means to walk like Abraham walked. That's in Romans 4. Uh, that's what practical faith looks like. So he says, uh, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I've heard from God. This you did not, Abraham. Abraham didn't do that. You do the deeds of your father. Oof. Then they said, now they're getting insulting. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They think they're godly. This is the problem of religious flesh. Religious flesh does not believe it needs to be crucified. Religious flesh believes it's of God and can be used by God, is pleasing to God, is serviceable to God, and should be honored, extolled, rewarded, applauded, praised, and watched. <laughs> That's what religious flesh is. But he says, that, and so they think they're, they, they were... Uh, of one father, God. No. He said, if God were your father, you'd love me because I proceed forth and come from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word again. They, there are people who just cannot hear the word. They are just resistant to the word. And it's getting to the point where you can't talk about it anymore. It's we're done arguing. The time is up kind of thing, you know? Um, but he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Wow, can you imagine? You serve your whole life. You became a Pharisee. You trained to observe the law. You pray everywhere you go. You give alms. You've got a reputation for being the most godly. People are afraid of you because of how spiritual you are. And you think this is pleasing to God. And then this guy comes and tells you you're of the devil. <laughs> and that is what happens when the word of the cross meets religious flesh. That's what it is. That's why people are so offended. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? If I'm telling you the truth, why won't you believe what sin can you convince me of, he says. They all hate him. You shouldn't hate somebody that isn't done anything wrong. Why do they hate him that much? Right? Well, it's because he's exposing them and he's revealing the truth. But he's doing it so that they can be saved. He's doing it out of love, even though he's saying such harsh things. These harsh things are just the reality of the situation we were born into in Adam. We, are, we were sons of the devil. We have to be saved. We have to be born of God. We have to be transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the beloved son. And the only way we can do that is believe that he is. He's the one who accomplished it. He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. You know, I used to worry so much that people would get offended at the truth and I couldn't figure out why. Maybe I wasn't saying it right, you know. No, they can't hear it. Why? You know, <laughs> Uh, because they're in the flesh, and the flesh is not as of, not of God. And anyone who doesn't see that their flesh needs to be crucified but gives it a pass will occupy this position of being an Ishmaelite, thinking they're an Israelite, uh, will be a child of bondage, thinking they're free, be illegitimate, thinking they're an heir, be a son of Satan, thinking that they're a son of God. Now, we're not talking ultimate here. Now, here he's talking about these Pharisees. But again, your flesh is an enmity against God and hates the word of the cross. And if you side with the flesh in the debate over the cross, you will find yourself increasingly offended and angry. Which means that you won't enjoy the fellowship, you'll persecute the sons of Isaac, or the children of promise, uh, and you'll be a stumbling block. And when you get to the kingdom... You'll, you'll be saved and yet through fire if you believed in Jesus. Remember, he's saying this to the people that believed in Jesus. He said, look, to those who believe in me, if you continue my word, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You'll be my disciple. They're like, what? Why do we have need to be free? We are free. We're children of Abraham. And then this whole thing starts. 
And before you know it, he's telling their children of the devil. And some of them are Pharisees, some of them are that are those that believed, but he's addressing them all. It is really interesting. If you look through it, it doesn't make a distinction. Then answered and said to them, here, uh, yeah, he, then Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, we have Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. This whole argument started between Jesus and those who believed on him when he told them that they needed to know the truth that would set them free and they needed to continue in his word. It's really interesting. Uh, Because you think he's just talking to the Pharisees that hate him. No, he's talking to the whole group, including those that believe. Believing is good, and it's the way in. But then we need to continue believing. (laughs) And that's what I would say. The gospel is, he died for my sins according to the scriptures and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. But what did the scriptures say about his death? And what did the scriptures say about his resurrection? What the ascended Christ, who has sat down at the right hand of God, revealed about his death after he'd accomplished it is part of a body of truth called my word. And if you continue in it, you'll be free. You'll become free. I will set you free. It is the truth that sets you free. It is the truth of the gospel that sets you free. And believing the gospel puts you on the path to freedom. But then you need to continue in the gospel until you become fully assured of all the different things that he accomplished in his death and resurrection. You've got to continue in his word. And the more you do, the freer you get because he is the word. The more word you have abiding in you, the more Christ is so real to you, precious to you, available to you, enjoyed by you. And so you get free, not because of your efforts, but because of your enjoyment. And there is a diligent effort to enter into rest, which means to cease from your dead works and stop trying and turn and serve the living God in the Holy of Holies, realizing that there's nothing I can do. Christ has to be everything. That's the beginning. And then learning, what does it mean that he's everything? That's the word of Christ. Um, Let's see here. Okay. Uh. Then the Jews said to him, How, now we know that you have a devil. Oh, okay. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to leave it off here. I've been talking for a real long time. Um, and I think I've said what felt I felt strongest to say in this session. I know this one was a little stronger than a lot of them. I'm uh, just, you know, we're in trying times. <laughs> so please pray that uh, all the believers would be at rest and at peace and would have discernment. And that uh, everything would be fully revealed and um, people would side with the gospel and not with men. And uh, that food would keep coming out to the church to nourish us while we wait on the Lord. All right, take care.